Welcome to everybody to the Newman Church Bible Architecture. It's a blessing to have you and it's a blessing to be here on the Thursday. For those who are not familiar with this ministry, you can find information in the link in the bio if you're watching this on YouTube. So God bless you abundantly. If you're also, if you're new to this, or if you've been watching us for some time, um, help us grow this ministry if you believe in what we are saying here. And the best way to do that, it is to like and share this video uh, for there isn't really another better, better way to help us grow. So praise God for that. So as I mentioned in the community page yesterday, we're about to share something absolutely monumental. Um, as always, this is a live service and thus far we haven't gotten into the, the the part where we edit our videos and make them you know cooler and shorter and um with lots of action it, they're just live services so what you see is is what you know we did on the live service so this requires a little bit of patience as we get to this material but um, it is something so monumental and so big um, that I would invite you to stay through the video. If you have to pause it, pause it. If you have to uh, grab your Bible, go ahead and do that. And if you have um, a notepad, I think that's the best way to follow along. So praise God for that. We are here not on our own merit, but out of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is our Lord and our Savior. And um, we are reminded that we're not saved by our own works, but we're saved by the blood of Christ who died um, on the cross of Calvary and resurrected on the third day. We believe in him. He is the word of God as per John 1, 1. And because of that, we believe in the word of God, which we are willing to follow and obey. And when we obey the word of God, then we receive the Holy Spirit. And this is really the truth of the gospel. We'll have a, a major teaching on this, I believe, this coming weekend. Um, when the Lord says, if you keep my word, you will have eternal life. We'll be teaching on that. This is something the Lord revealed to me um, just a couple of days ago and is 100% mind-blowing. Is not my wisdom. I always say that. This is not my wisdom. It's just the Holy Spirit teaching me, us, this church, with my brothers and sisters who are here, all of these uh, things. So I invite you to continue to follow and to come back for more teaching. So let's jump right into this. And we have several pieces and parts to this. We'll use as much as many tools as we can, I'll use to make it clear, uh, but taking notes is gonna help you a lot. So let's start with this one thing. First and foremost, my time is completely different than what it used to be only a few months back. Which means my routine is different. I used to wake up and spend a few hours um, on a given day studying the Word of God and receiving wisdom from the Holy Spirit, writing notes and creating the charts. And some of you have seen these in the various videos. But my life is radically different now. And this is because the Lord has led me to a different or, or kind of a parallel career path which takes up most of my day. So I wake up at six in the morning and most of you do that too. So you can sympathize. And then by 6.45, I'm on a train going into New York City. And then I'm there um, to the first hours of the afternoon and then I come back. So I have time to study the word of God when I'm riding the train back and forth, but it's not the same amount of time that it used to be. And so part of me was wondering how I was going to continue um, to receive wisdom from the Lord. And uh, it is one of the things that has, um, um, you know, has been on my mind for some time. However, the Lord is capable um, to do things in, in a way that we are not. And because of that, uh, he's able to deliver wisdom in a shorter period of time with the limited means that I have. And one of those things is just bringing my Bible, my physical Bible along with me um, and a notepad, which I have here. I'm going to show you just a regular notepad, uh, my physical Bible and just writing as we go. Why do I say this? Why do I premise this and say, oh, well, it's precious YouTube time. You know, we have to scroll to the next video. The reason that we're saying all these things is for this. 
we have to make sure it's not my wisdom. We have to make sure that this is not some fabrication that comes out of my imagination. Because if that's the case, if I'm the first one to discover that, we got to shut this down and move on to those who are actually speaking through the Holy Spirit. I will be the first one to say, let's move on. We don't need to listen to me. So the reason why I premise this is to show you that even more so, it's not possible for me to come up with these connections and these relationships in a very short, limited amount of time where I continue to say, I don't have my desk. I just have to kind of go, do it on the go. This to me is further proof, additional proof. Not that the word of God isn't the word of God because it, it is, but it's further proof that all that we receive here is not my wisdom. So praise God for that. So one of the things that the Lord has been leading me to see in the recent uh, last couple of weeks, and there is a video that has proven that, is Israel. But not Israel as the current geographical territory, but rather as the nation of the children of Israel, the chosen ones. So you've seen the video on Josephus, which explains again the same status of me jotting down these notes based on the wisdom I received. But notice that the Josephus teaching, right, which is an amazing proof that the Jews have received by a Jew the confirmation the Lord Jesus is the Messiah, right? In other words, here's the, here's the, here's the, the important thing about this. Josephus was allowed to continue on and become Josephus so that the Jews would know without excuse that Jesus is the Messiah. In other words, the Lord allowed him to be to still be a Jew and yet portray the truth, which is that the Lord Jesus is the Messiah. And we talked about the Galatians position, which is um, of attempting to continue to be Jew while embracing the new testament or the new covenant make sense yes so because of this opening into who josephus was and what the lord has shown me i can't explain ultimately why and how but as i am working so i, I go to work and then i come home and I continue working i often play videos to uh you know whatever the, the lord leads me to and he led me to two videos which speak about the coming of the Messiah according to Jewish perspective. So these are rabbis, okay? Jewish rabbis that talk about the coming of Messiah. Of Messiah. Now here's the interesting part. First and foremost, and there's plenty of videos on YouTube that, you know, uh, rabbis talk about. First and foremost, it seems clear that to the Jewish people, the Messiah is about to come. That's the first thing. It's not out in two, three, four, five, six hundred thousand years. They say they are the generation. Now, bear in mind that they're saying the Messiah technically is supposed to arrive by year 6,000, but they're only in 5785, right? So technically, they shouldn't even be worrying about it. Because for their calendar, according to their count, right, they're still two, three hundred years out. Is that right? Does it make sense? Is everybody? Okay, beautiful. But they're saying they are in the time of Messiah. So that's the first thing to know. There is an awareness that the arrival of Messiah, Messiah is imminent. So far, so good, right? So I watch a full video where there is a rabbi, a so-called expert, that teaches about what the messianic era is about. And I recommend you, you know, wearing the armor of God, but to, you know, to, to study the Jewish perspective, right? And ultimately, what was shocking about it is there is a lot of uh, understanding based, but we know it, of course, based on the Gospels, they have a very good understanding but mixed in with tremendous amount of human or let's say man doctrine in other words every time that these rabbis talk about the messiah 
this, the amount of scripture they, they quote is limited, if, if at all. But the amount of theories and philosophies of other rabbis is massive. This rabbi said this, and this other rabbi said this, and this was a great rabbi which spoke in the 1700s. Now, we know this from Jeremiah, right? 17. Verse 5, which will tell you, cursed is the man to trust in man. Now, this is their own Torah that will tell you why you're trusting man. But according to that perspective, they're not. They're just studying that, and they're going to the uh, enlightened ones. They explain the Torah to them. So the first step is they know Messiah is coming. Second step is they know a lot about the millennium. They call it the messianic era. And they also know a lot of what Messiah is supposed to be doing. So in that sense, they're, they've got a good understanding, right? But here's what's interesting. According to the Jewish tradition, and we're going to see if we can pull this off. I had to turn off a browser on the site because it was glitching a bit, but we're going to try to play through the iPad. According to the Jewish tradition, there isn't, there is not one Messiah, Messiah, but rather there are two. There are two Messiahs according to Jewish tradition. Let's call it tradition, but it's really taken out of the Torah, right? There is a Messiah ben David, which is Messiah, the son ben of David. And then there is a second Messiah called Messiah ben Yosef. Well, I'm, I'm just shaking just thinking about it. Messiah ben Yosef means... Messiah, the son of Joseph. Now, who's the father, the earthly father of Jesus? Joseph. They're thinking Joseph. We know is Joseph. They can't see that. The Lord fulfilled that too. In other words, they understand that there are two messiahs, but as a video that I'll show a clip of, here in, in this recording. So hang in there and hopefully we'll play all right. As this other rabbi explains, they don't want to talk about Messiah ben Joseph. Why? When I heard it from this rabbi, I almost fell off my chair because he says this. The reason why people in the Jewish community, we're talking rabbis teaching the Torah, don't want to talk about Messiah ben Joseph is because if you don't, this is what the rabbi, uh, the rabbi says, if you don't study it carefully, you might think it's Jesus. The Jews themselves don't talk about Messiah ben Joseph because it could seem as if it is Jesus. I was floored. They say, but of course, when we study carefully scripture and this and that, then we know that these are imposters or something, however they call it. The truth is, it's before their eyes. Why? Because what's the characteristic of Messiah ben Joseph that's different than Messiah ben David? Messiah ben Joseph, according to their understanding of scripture, has to die to redeem Israel. This is major and massive. This is not even the, the major revelation that I'm going to share and reveal in a minute or during this service this is just the introduction now pay, pay attention to the whole story they gave you i don't have the time to sit down and study hours and hours the lord is leading me to these targeted pieces of information to give me what i need to see the next step without a lot of background in other words i didn't study the subject for three four five years and write all the literature no i watched two videos and just like I didn't know about Josephus, I did not know about the two messiahs. I'm sure a lot of you watching this video didn't know that either, right? Okay. 
There are two messiahs. They know messiah is coming. The first messiah is Messiah ben Joseph, meaning the son of Joseph. And he's supposed to die to cleanse the sins of idolatry of Israel. This is enormous. So this rabbi, which I'll show a clip um, um, of his speech in a second, they say, but you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be worried about studying Ben Joseph because, you know, you know the Torah and you understand this is not Jesus. And Christians have just used this to their advantage. It's the same, the same doctrine they're teaching about Josephus. The same story they did when the resurrected uh, Christ resurrected and they paid the, the soldiers which we read where in the gospel, they paid the soldiers that they would not talk about the fact that it was resurrected. Now think about that. They didn't pay the soldier to camouflage something. They paid the soldier. They wouldn't speak about the truth. They actually knew. Now, bear in mind that last service for those of you who were uh, participating in our communion service on Sunday, I personally pray for the for the people of Israel. I felt tremendous grief and sadness in my heart to pray for them. That brought me to tears in the service. For those of you who were there, this is not against Israel whatsoever. It's the opposite. It's the idea that their their eyes have been blinded temporarily for our sake. The Lord is about to come, open their eyes. Isaiah fifty three will be revealed. Jeremiah and Zechariah will begin to make sense. But in the meantime, the meantime, their own tradition is telling them the truth. So now we have a Messiah Ben Joseph, right? Here's the thing. We're going to play this clip. I only watched two videos. I'll show you the sec a, a small portion of the second video that um, I watched. Hopefully it's going to play well here on the recording. So just be patient. Okay, we're going to play this. This is a rabbi, and he speaks about something that is monumental. So let's, let's give it a shot. The Zohar says that Mashiach ben Yosef doesn't have to die, and it's based on, a, uh, on an exposition of Psalm 118. Again, going to Psalms, we can see all the sources in Tanakh that speak about Mashiach ben Yosef. Psalm 118 is actually, the whole psalm is about Mashiach ben Yosef. It's, we read it during Hallel. So on Pesach next week, when you're reading Hallel, just pay attention to this psalm and you're going to see every verse in that psalm is going to remind you of this class because you're going to see how every verse is actually talking about Mashiach ben Yosef. Okay. So the whole point, he talks about Psalm 118. Let's pay attention to these numbers, okay? Psalm 118 as being all about Messiah, Mashiach, Ben Yosef. Are we good with, with this? Because this is coming to a place where we're going to see something unbelievable. I mean, it is believable because it's the Bible. So we have to understand the background first, right? The background is, I am riding my train and going with what the Lord shows me. 20 minutes here, 15 minutes here, 30 minutes here, right? So it's like targeted shots. The Lord shows me two videos on Messiah according to the Jews. And the second video brings in this argument of Messiah ben Joseph, the son of Joseph, as being the Messiah that will sacrifice himself, will die. Now I'll explain what this video actually means. And it's all about Psalm 118. This is the key. Psalm 118, okay? It's by their own speaking. Their own Jewish tradition tells the world that Psalm 118 is Messiah ben Joseph. We're good on this? Because this is not what I said. is what the Jewish experts, the Torah the rabbis studying the Torah are saying, he's saying all of Psalm 118 is about Messiah ben Joseph. 
Okay, good. Now here's something that we're going to need to, to do together. And I'm going to do it here in a simplified version. Let's see if we can do that. Now, there is something in the Bible that if it's important to know is that numbers work in a particular way. Now we've seen it with this ministry, you know, we've, you've seen in other, many other ministries and, and, you, and you just know by how even the Lord operates. You know, we've seen the brads, for example, multiplications and things like that. Okay. Now, I think actually it might be best to do this on, let's do this on the whiteboard. It will be just a little more clear for all of us. So I'm going to start a whiteboard. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to continue to tell you what this is all about. There's a little bit of a, bit of a glitch if you're watching the recording. Don't stress, we will get better at this technology at some point. Now, the most important thing to understand here is this. And for those who are in the live service, just remember to hang on for one second. And we're going to get this uh, going. Okay. All right. And we are about ready to start the whiteboard. Okay. There. All right. So let's do it here. Now we're talking about Messiah ben Joseph. Okay. And Psalm 118. Okay, so let's write here Psalm 118. Okay, beautiful. I'm going to put it here, and I'm going to stretch it out a little bit here, so it's a little better. Okay, now, Psalm 118, why is that so particular? I, I think I've done an, uh, another video about this, but we're going to we're gonna just uh, repeat some of these things that we know. The Bible has, the total Bible, okay, the Bible has a total of 66 books. Okay, we all know that. We understand that. But the difference is that there is also not just books, but there is also chapters. See, it's jumping up a little bit here. With the help of the Holy Spirit, we'll get this done just well. Okay, we have a total amount of chapters. Okay, and the total amount of chapters is 1,189 chapters. Good? Okay. Why is this relevant? Because when we take, let's say, half of the chapters on one side, then the middle chapter, and then the other half of the chapters on the other side, this is what we get. Okay. This is what we get. And I write it here. We get a total, okay, 1,188 chapters plus the middle chapter. Right? Because if it's 1,189 and you take the middle chapter out, you're left with 1,188. Make sense? Okay. So the middle chapter would split 1188 chapters on two sides. 594 chapters on one side. Okay. There. And 594 chapters on the other side. Okay. Leaving us what? The middle chapter. Okay. This middle chapter here, which will be 1189, but in the middle, so far so good? Okay. Happens to be this one middle chapter. Let's draw it like that. Okay. Happens to be what? What is this middle chapter of the Bible? Psalm 118. Psalm 118 
is the middle of the Bible. Now, you just watched the video, right? What did that video say? Messiah ben Joseph, you heard it from their or his presentation. Messiah ben Joseph, which is the Messiah that comes before Messiah ben David, is the one that's supposed to be uh, this, this supposed to be killed, so he dies for the redemption of the people. It's all about Psalm 118. Psalm 118, it's all about this Messiah ben Joseph. Psalm 118, according to the Bible, which is 66 books, is the exact mathematical middle of the Bible. So far, so good? Okay. Beautiful. So here's what we're going to do. We're now going to go to Psalm 118, right? Here we have it. Now, look at Psalm 118. First of all, how many verses we have in Psalm 118? Total is 29 verses, right? Beautiful. Now, what is particular about Psalm 118? It has 29 verses, right? But there's another thing that's very particular. It is the middle, the middle chapter of the Bible. We just said it. Before Psalm 118. Let's look at it here. Before Psalm 118. What do we have? 117, which is what? How many, how many verses in 117? Two verses, right? Is what? The shortest, shortest chapter of the entire Bible. Okay. What about the next one is Psalm 119. How many verses? How many verses in Psalm 119? 176. Making it what? The longest, longest. That alone is proof of what the Bible is, the 66 books, because you can only do with 66 books. Now, I want somebody to prove to me that they fabricated it 3,000 years ahead of time to match all of these. We know, it's, we know it's God, right? Okay. So Psalm 118 is the middle of the Bible. We just proved it. By Jewish doctrine, it talks about Messiah ben Joseph. Correct, right? It's in the middle, and it shows that this shortest psalm or the shortest chapter is Psalm 117, and the longest, Psalm 119. So far, so good? Okay. Now, let's look at this. When you go to Psalm 118, okay, I'm going to show you more, more confirmations as we get to this revelation. We're going to read through Psalm 118 so that you understand the density. That's exactly what this rabbi is talking about. When you read through Psalm 118, you see there's something special about it. Okay, so let's read through Psalm, Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endures forever. How many times have you heard that one particular verse? Many times, right? His mercy endures forever. Psalm 118. Okay, let's continue. This is just the first verse. Second verse. Let Israel now say, that his mercy endures forever. Let the, uh, the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endures forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. Now, here it is, verse 5. How many times you've heard this verse? I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in the large place. Verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can men do to me? Verse 7. The Lord taken my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. Verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. How many times have we heard that verse? Verse 9, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. 
Here it is, verse 10. All nations can pass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. 11. They can pass me about. Yea, they can pass me about, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They can pass me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Verse 13. Thou hast thrust a sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord help me. Here it is, another verse. The Lord is my strength and my song and is become my salvation. How many times have you heard that verse? This is all one psalm. So, uh, verse 15, the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Verse 16, the right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Verse 17, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Verse 18, the Lord has chastened me sore, but he has not given me over unto death. 19, open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. Verse 20, this gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. 21, I will praise thee for thou hast hurt me and art become my salvation. Here's another verse you've heard hundreds of times. Verse 22, the stone which the builders refused is become the head stone of the corner. <laughs> there is no doubt about this one verse, right? Let's continue. Verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 24, you heard that how many times? This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Verse 25. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blast 26. How many times have you heard this one? Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Verse 27. God is the Lord, which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Finally, verse 29. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, let me ask you, how many times have you heard many of these verses? Hundreds of times. They're all from Psalm 118. We just proved two things. It's the middle of the Bible, right? And the Jews, rabbis, um, st students of the Torah, believe it to be the description of Messiah. Now we read, let's look at that again. We read the verse that talks about, verse 22, the stone which the builders refuse is become, become the head of the corner, right? So that alone, we know what that is. That's the Lord Jesus. But let's look at this carefully. Here, here comes the, the big revelation, which is connected to other things that we might or might not get into this teaching on the YouTube, on the YouTube video. Uh, but we'll see how the Lord leads us. So it's 29 verses, okay? We see it there, 29, okay? So if one, Psalm 118 is the middle of the Bible, right? That's the, the central chapter. And he has 29 verses, okay? We divide 29 in two, we get what? 14 and a half, right? 14.5. So verse 14 Going into verse 15, is not 15 yet, is, but it's no longer 14. It's in between 14 and 15, right? Would be the mathematical center of the Bible. Is that right? Okay, let's repeat. Psalm 118, which just demonstrates the middle of the Bible, right? 29 verses. When we divide that in half, 
we get 14 and a half. So we have to be in verse 14 going into verse 15. That would be the mathematical center of the Bible. We agree with that? Okay, so let's look at this. Verse 14, what does it say? Verse 14 says, The Lord is my strength and song and is become my salvation. Okay, let's go into the Hebrew. You okay with that? Let's go look at it in the Hebrew. Let's see what the Hebrew tells us about this verse. Okay, I'm going to stretch it out a little bit here. Okay, Psalm 118, verse 14. Okay, it says, My strength and song, Yah, Yah, which means God, right? Yah, okay, which means here, 30, 50, okay, Yah, okay, 30, 50. Look at those two numbers, 3 and 5, right? 53, 153, okay. Lord, Yah, okay, contracted form of Yahweh, okay, which is the personal name of God in the Hebrew Bible. We're okay with that? Okay, so what is Psalm 118? I'm talking about Psalm 118, verse 14, the mathematical verse of the Bible. It says, my strength and song, Yah, which is God, has become, pay attention, Yah has become, and remember, we're transitioning from 14 into 15, right? And that would be the absolute center of the Bible. So the last word in this verse is the center of the Bible, which says, Yah, which is God, God has become my salvation, which is what? Yahshua, Yahshua, praise the Lord, praise God. The center of the Bible is Yahshua, and in the verse it says, God has become Yahshua, which means Jesus is God. That's by their own, their own admission that Psalm 118 is the tale description of messiah coming to the world now when i saw that i just didn't know what else to say remember i don't have time to do extensive research the lord led me to two or three things to get to this conclusion which we're seeing right here yeshua is the absolute center of the Bible in a verse that is about, as we just learned, Messiah ben Joseph, where the verse says, Yah has become my salvation. God has become my salvation. And here we see it again in the English translation, the Lord is my strength and song and is become my salvation. What does it mean is become? It means what John 1.14 says. What does John 1.14 say? Okay, let's go to John 1.14. This is, this is beyond belief. It's not something I can come up with. This is not something, you know, that I sit down and say, okay, let's, let's try to figure this out. Here it is. Sorry, not John 1.14. John 1.14. Okay, so Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. Okay, it says, and the word was made flesh. God has become salvation. The word was made flesh. We see this? Unbelievable. The Jewish rabbis, which study the Torah, cannot understand it because the Holy Spirit is not operating through them because they've embraced the spirit of Antichrist, which is any spirit that denies Christ is called spirit of Antichrist. Now, that's why we pray for Israel, because the, the truth is before their eyes. They even see it themselves, but they have to deny it, even when it's before their eyes. Even when Josephus, their own main historical writer, wrote about the Messiah, they deny it. 
Now, with great love for this country, for, with great love for these people, with, great, with knowing the, the Lord, the love that the Lord has for them and anyone of, of us who has Jewish descendants or blood or in any form is connected with Israel. There's great love for this country and for these people. But this is what the Lord has shown me. Now, I'm going to show you something else as an additional confirmation of this, just because I know this is so monumental that it's worth spending a little bit extra time, even with the limited uh, resources and technology that we have here. But I really want to show you some of these things. And, and it's, it's probably 10% of even just the material that he already gave me. But for the sake of this video, I'm going to make it just a little more com compacted. So as you've seen, my Bible also as just like any Bible, really, I believe at this point, but has all of these additional confirmations. So we said it's Psalm 118, okay? Psalm 118. So I'm going to show it to you in my physical Bible. This is the Bible I am reading when I'm on the train. So hopefully you get to see it. That is over, oops, there. Okay, that's Psalm 118, right? What page is it on? Can you see it? 881. 881 for Psalm 118. 118, 881. That alone to me is monumental. Just like say, okay, let me just put an additional extra thing in there. Okay, so let's flip the page. We just said is 1188. 1188 chapters divided into. Okay, 1188. When I turn the page, obviously it's going to be page 882, right? No question on that. You can see it's page 882. But the first verse is 1188. 1188, which is the number of chapters that the psalm divides. That's the first verse, which says it is better to trust in God than to trust in man. Not only that, but page 882. Two means, look at my fingers, 1-1. One, one. So, 8-8-1-1. Eight, eight, one, one. One, one, eight, eight. On page 882. Which is again another confirmation of Psalm 118, verse 8. On top of that, and this is part of a second teaching, which we'll have as a... Uh, follow up on this. What will be the next page? Logically, after AA2, obviously comes AA3. No question about that. That's page AA3. You can see it right there, right? Okay. But when you scroll down here, what verse we have? Now we have Psalm 119, verse 31, 911 of 31 which is 83.33 years do i just need to keep going and you know what's in that verse psalm 119 verse 31 why am i showing you this i'm showing you this to show you that one is not my wisdom two the lord is telling us a story psalm 118 is the middle of the bible it is about mashiach it is about the return of the lord now the return of the lord we are given a timing now of course we could be wrong in all things for sure but the most important thing we shouldn't and we can't be wrong is that make sure it's not our wisdom and make sure it's the lord telling us something once we know that the the rest the lord will help us because we can only see dimly right so if it is about Mashiach and Mashiach is coming and we know there's 83.33 years that we've been led to see, these 83.33 years are completed when? September 11, 9-11 of 31. 9-11 of 31. There it is. 9-11 of 31. 119 verse 31. 1, 1, 9, 31. Page 883. 83.3 years. And you know what you want to know what that verse says? Okay, here's what the verse says. 
I read it from my Bible. I have stuck, Psalm 119, verse 31, I have stuck unto thy testimonies. It means I've kept your word. I've kept your testimonies, right? O Lord, put me not to shame. Where else do we read? Pay attention. Remember 119, verse 31, right? September 11 of 2031, pointing to, leading us to see that. Where else have we seen, have I kept, have I kept thy testimonies? Okay, you want to see it somewhere else? Okay, go to Revelation chapter 3. Okay, ready? Because remember, we're talking about hand of days, return of the Lord, completion of the fig tree generation. Okay, Revelation 3, verse 10. 3, 10, 3, 1, 0. 31, right? 20, 31. One more time. One more confirmation, okay? And what does it say? Just like Psalm 119, verse 31, Revelation 3, 10, 3, 1, 0. It says, because you have kept the word of my patience, Lord, I've kept thy testimony. And the Lord says, because you kept the word of, thy pa of my patience, I also will keep you from what? From the hour, hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That's the church of Philadelphia, the only one that will be spared from the wrath to come. Oh, glory to God. To conclude this teaching, before you go, please, if you watch thus far, support this channel. I always say, and I think it's worth repeating every single time, one, I'm not here for the views, but I'm definitely here for the Lord. And because we're here for the Lord, we live in a time where people go less and less to a physical place, but spend the entire day on these phones and tablets. Now, if we are able to share content that comes from the Holy Spirit and more people see it, then we're doing the work of God. Now, if you don't agree with what this has been said here, well, that's a different story. You shouldn't be watching up until now but if you had then it would be a wonderful thing and it would be a, a form of brotherly love so subscribe s leave a like and share this message second the whole idea of why the lord is showing us confirmations upon confirmations upon confirmations is so that we can be ready ready for the day that he will call us personally collectively or however else he decides to do that we live in a time of deception, but the Lord is giving us the blessing of seeing the truth, which we've just proven it. What else we need with all of these so-called coincidences, which are not coincidences to prove that the Bible is the Bible, is the word of God, the old and the new Testament together. This does not mean that we're going to go and get circumcised and start celebrating the Passover. The Bible is clear about that. The Lord is our Passover. But it means that we're following in the spirit of the law. In the spirit, not in the letter. Meaning we are above the law. Meaning we're performing at a higher, even moral standard. As we're taught in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Before, as I always reminded by the Holy Spirit, before you were not to commit adultery with your neighbor's wife, now you can't even, and you shouldn't even think about doing it because you already committed adultery in your heart. Before, you, it was good enough not to kill someone. Now, the Lord calls you not to even hate someone in your heart. How is that easier? It's not easier. It's so much harder, but it's so much easier because it's the Holy Spirit doing that work in us. Now, if we try to do it on your own, like when you were in the world, you can't do it. You have to keep hating, bad-mouthing people, stealing, and doing all kinds of abominations. But because the Holy Spirit is in you and you're renewed by his word, then you've seen the fruits of the Holy Ghost. But the church is not focusing on this. The church is focusing on the day of the rapture and is focusing on as long as you confessed with your mouth, you say, which means you, according to the paper church, you've said, I believe in Christ, you're good to go. Now, I do honestly know and believe in my heart that the Lord gives each one of us a particular time and a particular path 
to get in right order with him, to get in the right relationship with him. I n- really believe that. So, so everybody is on a different path of sanctification, of getting closer to the Lord. That is true. But nevertheless, I wouldn't count on infinite amount of time or an extended amount of time to begin to draw closer to the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit to work through you, which means we're going to see these fruits. Yes, we preach fruits, not because we, but because the Lord preaches fruits. This coming weekend, we will talk about the Lord teaching us about um, uh, John 8, 51, which says, uh, if you keep my commandments, you will have eternal lives. Or if you keep my saying, rather, he says, if you keep my saying, you will have eternal life. Now, I will explain what the Lord told me about that. Sister Tina, can you confirm is John 8, 51? I believe it is. I'm going to check that uh, before we leave. So, what does that mean? Yeah. John 8, 51. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. We'll talk about that. It's major what the Lord has allowed me to see in this one verse. If you keep my saying, you will never see death. Wouldn't that be important? Wouldn't you want to know that you will not see death? If, he says, if you keep my saying. Oh, glory to the Lord Jesus. I hope this message was encouraging. May the Lord Jesus bless and protect you. In Jesus' name, amen.